there's more cocaine in the world right now than there has ever been before. And all of it is coming from this region in South America. Most of it is being transported on large commercial cargo ships. It's The Big Take from Bloomberg News and iHeartRadio. I'm Wes Kosova. Today, inside the global supply chain for cocaine. In December, we told you the wild story of smugglers who hid 20 tons of cocaine worth a billion dollars aboard a massive container ship traveling to Europe from South America, and how the U.S. found out and seized the drugs when the ship made a stop at the port of Philadelphia. That was a huge bust, but it barely made a dent in the global cocaine supply. For every shipment that seized, many, many more tons go undetected. My colleagues Lauren Etter in Los Angeles and Vernon Silver in Rome are here with me now to tell the next part of the saga. What happens when all that cocaine reaches port in Europe? Lauren, Vernon, thanks for being here. Hey, thanks a lot. Glad to be here. Thank you. You and our colleague Patricia Laya have written a big investigation for Bloomberg Business Week that details the booming cocaine industry in Europe. And your story begins with a business importing fruit. Vernon, maybe I'll start with you. Can you describe what happened? There's been this increasing problem, especially around the ports in Europe, in this case, the Netherlands, with these fruit shipments having cocaine in them. In this particular case, in May 2019, a warehouse of the uh, De Groot Fresh Group in a small town about an hour away from Rotterdam's port, they were going through their bananas, and the employees there found 400 kilos of cocaine. That's a street value of about $30 million. At this point, it had already become policy of this company that when they found the cocaine, you know, they'd never found this much before, uh, they were just going to call the police and turn it over to the authorities, which is what they did. But within weeks, the unexpected happened. Word had gotten out that this fruit company had found the cocaine and turned it over to the cops. And the two brothers, whose family for generations had owned this company that had grown into you know, a huge importer of bananas, uh, started getting threatening messages. And someone who was claiming that it was their cocaine that had been turned over to the police said that he wanted compensation for his loss. They threatened the group family, they threatened uh, the employees, they tried to get payment in millions of euros in both uh, Bitcoin and cash in handovers that never happened uh, because the company and the family that owned it wouldn't cooperate and wouldn't give in to the extortion claims. And that began what turned into a two-year reign of terror in this small town, the municipality is called Mastril, where there were shootings and fire bombings of the homes of people first connected to the company, its owners, and then just people who had worked there, you know, former employees, current employees. And in one case, in the middle of the night, these two brothers, Henry and Jan Willem uh, Siepers, who had both worked in the warehouse, they were to crash through the window and then an explosion. And within minutes, they found themselves jumping out the windows and uh, you know, barely came away with their lives and you know, broken bones and their house was burned to the ground. And that was kind of the peak of what looking back on it was the, um, really the terrorizing of an entire small community at the end point of a global supply chain. Lauren, obviously what Vernon describes is a very extreme example of one of the effects of the growing cocaine trade throughout Europe. But this sort of thing where companies are discovering huge amounts of cocaine in shipments they know nothing about is not exactly uncommon. That's right. Over the past few years, especially in Northern Europe, as the cocaine trade has shifted from Spain, the Iberian Peninsula, to the major commercial ports of Northern Europe and the Netherlands and Belgium, the discovery and the interception of cocaine in shipping containers has become 
really a regular occurrence. So much so that the customs officials and law enforcement authorities in those nations and those ports are really struggling to keep up with the amount of cocaine that's essentially deluging their ports. The amount of cocaine that is flowing into Europe's largest two ports in the Netherlands, uh, Rotterdam and Belgium, Antwerp, has really skyrocketed over about a five-year time period. So it's become a crisis for officials there, and they really are tasked with finding what's often described as a needle in a haystack because the cocaine is hidden in all kinds of consumer goods, whether it's tennis shoes or computer parts or scrap metal, um, but it's primarily hidden in refrigerated containers that are carrying perishable goods such as fresh produce, vegetables, um, shrimp, those types of items. And this cocaine is all coming from South America, is that right? Oh, yes. It all comes from South America. There are three primary countries that grow coca, and it's largely Colombia, but it's also Bolivia and Peru. And so there has been an explosion in the amount of coca that's being grown in these nations for lots of reasons. Um, and a colleague of ours wrote an article describing the production in coca and also cocaine as being actually the golden age of coca. Cocaine right now. There's more cocaine in the world right now than there has ever been before. And all of it is coming from this region in South America. Most of it is being transported on large commercial cargo ships. And the vast majority of it is arriving in Northern Europe, where these large ports are. Vernon, there's so much cocaine, as Lauren describes, coming into Europe that it's actually become kind of cheap. What's incredible is, you know, the U.N. and also European authorities track the street value and prices of, of cocaine. And what you're seeing is prices per gram in the U.S. have you know, uh, kept up. You know, we're talking about, you know, you can pay 120 to $200 for a gram. But in the areas where this stuff is coming in, primarily Belgium and the Netherlands, you can get a gram of coke for, you know, 65 dollars or less what that amounts to and you know i spent two weeks traveling around the netherlands working on this story is you can get you know for what you pay let's say for a margarita in antwerp you could probably get three or four lines of cocaine so when people are being frugal and things are costing more and the cost of a dinner out costs uh, you know 20 percent more than it was a year ago the one thing that's gotten cheaper is cocaine. And that has just a lot to do with the complete flooding of the market through this surge of, of cocaine that's riding on top of the fruit shipments. And of course, cheaper prices means there's even more demand and more demand means there's going to be more supply. And so it just keeps on growing. One of the really interesting things in this system that you're describing seems to be that the nations producing all of this cocaine and the drug cartels that want this supply to distribute in Europe were able to do this because of advances in shipping fruit. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's really fascinating. When you start looking at the numbers, when you look at kind of this spike in cocaine um, imports into into Northern Europe, and it's really over kind of a five this five to seven year time period, um, there was a concurrent spike in the amount of fruit that was exported and other perishable goods from South America. They almost parallel one another. So what's happened is that the drug traffickers have figured out that there is increasing efficiency in the transportation of fresh fruits and vegetables from South America to Northern Europe. And there's also been an increase in sort of the infrastructure that's been built up around the international shipment of these goods. The ports in South America have been really improved and lots of uh, private investment has gone into these ports, allowing larger ships to call port there. Um, there's been all along the supply chain, what they call the cold chain. There's been all kinds of innovations. The shipping companies have rolled out new shipping containers that have innovations such as 
allowing fruit to ripen more slowly on the long voyage across the Atlantic Ocean from South America to Europe. And just a larger number of containers, they call them reefers or refrigerated containers that are making that journey. And that's largely because there's growing demand in Western European countries, just like there is in the United States and other markets, but for year-round access to fresh fruits and vegetables, products that consumers were only able to get during seasons, when they were in season, they can now get them year round because they can, you know, they're shipped across the world with increasing efficiency and the prices have come down, all of that. So that's a long story behind the reasons why traffickers realize that there is this increasing amount of just legitimate cargo that's moving from their key part of the world Latin America, South America to Europe. And they really just piggybacked on that supply chain. They figured out there are all kinds of ways to penetrate that supply chain, whether it's infiltrating the exporter or the importer, or as we wrote about uh, a few weeks ago, infiltrating the crew of major shipping companies to be able to load cocaine in the middle of the ocean as the ship is moving from one continent to another. The traffickers are logistics experts, and they have figured out that if they can piggyback on the increasingly efficient logistics and supply chain of the major shipping companies, that it's been very good business for them, and they've been able to move um, increasingly large volumes and quantities of cocaine. Lawrence hit on a really good point. From the European side, uh, one of the you know the more interesting and surprising things about the reporting from these stories was the data that explained what I was seeing here in Europe. You know, I'm based in Italy, and I got to say, before you know COVID times, something like a, a an avocado that was worth eating, or blueberries, or you know mangoes, forget about it. You know, this was like you could go to a specialty market and maybe find one. You could buy avocados um, that were, you know, maybe ripe if you kept them around for a while and they were ripe for half a day uh, to the point where like we'd go back to the U.S. and, you know, the first thing that our family would get for us if we went to California was, you know, a big bowl of avocados so we could make guacamole. Seeing the reporting on this story out of South America where I saw like, oh gosh, from Peru, exports of fruit to Europe have doubled in the four years through 2021. That explained what I was seeing here, which is, you know, coming out of COVID, I could go to the supermarket and it's like, gosh, there's, you know, they're mangoes. And until seeing the reporting for this story, it didn't click that there were real changes here. Demand has changed. Europe is getting tons more of this stuff. And you follow it into the port, you're finding then the cocaine. We went through the press releases uh, from the prosecutors in the Netherlands uh, for every press release they had over the past year of drug busts and narrowed them down to busts in the Rotterdam port. And then from there, looked at what was in the containers where they were finding this. And a little more than half the time, it was fresh fruits and vegetables. Uh, so there's like there's a direct correlation between what you're seeing coming out of Latin America right now and what you're seeing on the ground in the markets and in the drug busts uh, in Europe. You know, it's, it's one of these things where it's like it's right in front of you like that the that the piggybacking was happening and it all sort of fit together in this aha moment. Lauren and Vernon, please stick around. Our conversation continues after the break. Lauren, this coincidence of geography lets cocaine hitch a ride on fruit shipments to Europe. But you write that packing cocaine with fruit gives the drug runners another advantage once the ship reaches port in Europe. Can you describe why that is? Yes, there is this increasing efficiency along this logistics supply chain, along this cold chain. But the other really important factor here is that customs officials are under constant pressure to ensure that the supply chain moves quickly and smoothly and efficiently, and to ensure that the amount of cargo, that the cargo coming into their ports is not being held up unnecessarily. So they're 
Customs officials are actually under a lot of pressure to rapidly push through the containers to make sure that they reach their ultimate destination to not slow down the rhythm of trade, of global trade, essentially, because there's a lot of money on the line. There are customers waiting for their items. The shipping companies are very powerful, and they really don't want this, the trade to be slowed down. So what that means is that when you're shipping a product like fresh fruit— there's an even greater sense of urgency to ensure that the product is is moved swiftly through customs. And the traffickers know that because bananas can rot, shrimp can go bad. And so they realize that customs officials, when they come across a container filled with perishable goods, there's a sense of urgency there that they're going to process it quickly, get it out of the shipyard into the market, and that they're not going to detain that container unnecessarily. What's interesting is that there isn't a no tolerance, zero tolerance view of this stuff getting through that in the customs industry. And remember, the like customs was set up as an idea centuries ago as a way for countries to collect taxes. This is a this is a revenue business. It's not necessarily a law enforcement business. And I, I went to a, a meeting of the World Customs Organization in Maastricht, and it was all about the technology that can be used to sort of tilt the balance of, you know, speeding things through versus catching the contraband. It was about the balance. It wasn't about making sure that nothing made it through. And part of what Lauren found in her reporting was like, it is the cost of doing business for the drug traffickers that they know some of it will get taken by the by the cops, but a lot will get through. Lauren, to Vernon's point, you write that authorities are seizing more cocaine than ever before, but they can only inspect a small number of the thousands of containers that arrive each day. So a lot more is probably getting through. Is that right? Yeah, it's really surprising, actually, and it really just goes to show just the immense task that confronts customs officials. But globally, only 2% of containers are inspected by customs officials. So of the hundreds of millions of containers that are being shipped around the world going to ports, 2% or less are inspected, are pulled out of the supply chain, the stream of commerce, and inspected by customs officials. But in Northern Europe, in in Antwerp and in Rotterdam, it's actually much less than 2%. It's around 1%, between 1% to 2%. And that's partly a function of the just the sheer difficulty of doing this. They first have to target the containers and figure out where is the cocaine. It's this ultimate game of hide and seek because the traffickers are constantly shifting their methods. You know, once the law enforcement officials are kind of on to them, they come up with a new scheme to evade detection. And they've done this over and over and over again. So the police are always trying to kind of chase them, figure it out. But they're also, the customs officials are trying to target which containers the cocaine might be in. So the mayor of Rotterdam, he has explained that he would like to see every single container from South America carrying fruit to be inspected by customs officials. And this was seen as kind of a radical proposal because what that means is that if you're a legitimate shipper of bananas from Colombia or Ecuador, you're going to automatically have your container pulled aside, pulled off the ship, pulled into the scanning facility and held for hours, if not days. And meanwhile, your, your bananas might rot, your customers getting upset because they haven't received the product yet. And you may or may not find cocaine in that shipment. So even though customs authorities are inspecting just 1% to 2% of containers that arrive in their ports, in 2021, European Union authorities seized more than 240 tons of cocaine. It was a record amount. It was triple the amount uh, seized in 2016. You can imagine that they're seizing this record amount of cocaine, but even more than that is likely getting through. Vernon, once all that cocaine gets to shore, they have to get it off the ships and get it into the hands of the distributors. How do they get it from the port into the streets? Yeah, I mean, this is sort of an amazing part of going through the court records of the past decade and talking to experts was seeing how this has evolved. 
They've gone from a system where these container ships would start pulling up towards the port and somewhere in the North Sea, you know, dump bags, you know, essentially duffel bags off the back of these uh, big ships and be met by fishing boats that would pick them up at sea to just having it packed in the containers, which means that the action is now on shore in the ports themselves and in warehouses. On the street level in cities like Rotterdam, the, the problem is that you have a lot of young people who are underemployed and who all of a sudden can be paid for one big mission where they get into a port and they get into a container and they somehow, you know, they grab the duffel bags full of cocaine and, you know, all, you know, in quotes, all they need to do is get it from there into a car and off the grounds of the port and to a distribution center or warehouse where these drugs are being accumulated. So I spoke to the mayor of Rotterdam, Ahmed Abu Taleb, and this was a real pain point for him. He has watched his city kind of transform as a cocaine trade has really kind of swept across Rotterdam. And one of the things that is really heartbreaking for him and also just very problematic in terms of solving is that there are so many young people who are at risk of being recruited by the drug traffickers to do these jobs. And they appear as kind of simple jobs, right? You might earn 10,000 euro to climb the fence of the shipyard, go in under the cover of night, sneak into or break into one of these containers that is known to be containing cocaine, snatch the bags out of there, the, the duffel bags of cocaine, and then jump the fence and run away and, you know, deliver the cocaine to the traffickers. That's just one job that you might be able to earn 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 euro. As opposed to, you know, taking a normal kind of legitimate job as a carpenter or as a plumber or as working in a shop. And so the mayor feels really up against the traffickers and the organized crime groups in a sense that how can legitimate employers compete with those wages that the traffickers are offering? So he described it really as kind of an undermining of civil society because it's not overt all the time. It's just kind of these subtle ways where the criminal organizations kind of undermine legitimate kind of trade and undermine the above board markets and how that has a trickle down effect and kind of captures these young men or, you know, boys in some instances who then get really kind of lured into this trade. He actually told me kind of an interesting and a little bit of a chilling story about how the traffickers work and how they kind of get people to cooperate with them. And this was actually involving shipping company employees or port workers. So the way it might work is you work at, say, a dock, and your job is to kind of make sure the containers kind of, you know, come in and come out on time. And somebody might approach you and say, hey, we have this side job for you. We we just need you for 10,000 euro to look the other way just for five minutes. Step away from your post for five minutes and we'll give you 10,000 euro. And the guy's like, eh, I don't know if I really want to do that. It's a little risky, but he agrees. So he does the job. They say, okay, meet us at this restaurant afterwards and we're going to give you your payment. When he arrives to pick up his payment, sitting there is not only the traffickers who are going to pay him, but one or two other employees at the port who now know that this individual has done something illegal. So in that very subtle way, he's now captured by the organization because he has these other people and he's in on it and you can't kind of back out of that. So they're very sophisticated in the way that they recruit individuals, the way that they capture them. And kind of once you're in, it's very hard to get out. The ports and the customs officials will actually tell their employees, like, please do not wear your uniform if you're going to leave, like, say, go pump gas or go to a restaurant or anything like that, because you suddenly become a target. And they're constantly being bombarded. There are traffickers that look for them on LinkedIn. They'll send them messages on LinkedIn and say, hey, do you want to earn, you know, a little money on the side? They are being hunted by these organized criminals trying to recruit them into the trade. And it's uh, it's a very tricky problem that the city and the ports and the customs officials are facing. We'll be right back.
Bernie, we've heard how this sophisticated international operation works, but who's in charge of it? Who are the organizations or cartels behind it all? What they're dealing with is transnational organized crime. There's no one location or one group, for example. It's not, you know, just the Sicilian mafia. It's many of them working together. And from these investigations that European authorities have done, we see connections to Eastern Europe. We see connections where some people from the Netherlands are now based out of uh, the Persian Gulf countries. We see North Africa being involved. And this is partly because of distribution, uh, this is partly because of, you know, how Lauren in her reporting about the shipping itself has connected uh, some of this to crews from the Balkans. They have found from north to south and east to west through Europe one connection, which is the cash that they can make off of this new flood of cocaine. And that's why it's been so hard, sort of like, you know, a multi-headed monster for them to whack it. You know, in in the Netherlands, they talk about some kind of Moroccan mafia. But is it does it have anything really to do with Morocco? In Italy, where a lot of this stuff has also come in, it's the traditional organized crime groups. Um, and then in Eastern Europe, you were dealing with organizations that can, you know, connect more deeply into Central Asia. It's truly a, a multinational conglomerate. And all of this money has effects. You can see it, as you write, in Rotterdam that there are the effects of drug wealth wherever you go. In Rotterdam, you know, the city officials took me around for a walking tour. And the first thing that was interesting was how afraid they were. They, they said they feel safe in their city and all this. But when it came down to using anybody's names or describing their titles, they didn't want to do that for the reasons that Lauren outlined about everyone being a target. If somebody knows what you do, you can be targeted. So in some sort of anonymity, they took me for this walk around what seemed to me to be a really lovely neighborhood. Little by little, they pointed out what they were seeing. There were lots of gold and jewelry shops with no customers in them, which to them were signs of potential money laundering. Some of them had changed hands and ownership, you know, two or three times in the last couple of years. Another sign. We walked past a restaurant on a corner that a beautifully rebuilt facade, new paint, colored glass. Um, again, dinner time, no customers in there. And as they pointed out, they had learned that the person who paid for this stuff was just renting. It wasn't even his building. And then we we keep going down this boulevard to a strip of garages with lots of BMWs and Audis parked in the driveways. And they said that this is where the drug runners come to get their automobiles fitted out with secret compartments. And these secret compartments is where these duffel bags and bricks of cocaine are stashed to then be driven down, you know, these these big uh, highways that go down into the rest of Europe and uh, all over the place. Has the rise in cocaine trafficking in the Netherlands and other countries in Europe led to an increase in violent crime as well? The nutty thing is that nationwide, the stats show that violent crime of all types has been decreasing. But that doesn't mean that life is better uh, in some way because of it. There is this permeation in society there of, of a sort of fear not that they are themselves targets of specific violent crimes, but they could be, that someone in their family might be targeted, that, you know, there have been assassinations of a journalist and a lawyer who are working on drug cases. There's sort of a paradox to it. Things have gotten nicer, but they've gotten worse. There were these chilling photographs published this past year when a prosecutor showed how they had found torture chambers. One had a dentist chair in it with straps on it. And fittingly, these torture chambers they found uh, had been found in shipping containers. Is there anything that can be done to actually stem the flow of cocaine, uh, given what an enormous challenge it is? It really depends on who you talk to. The shipping companies and um, others in the shipping industry will often say, like, look, there is a demand there for this product, and there's nothing that we can really do to stop it. I mean, there are all kinds of steps and measures that they could take. Um, but again, it gets to the root of this issue, which is institutions not wanting to disrupt this smooth flow of global trade. So the mayor of Rotterdam has kind of taken on this 
as a mission. And he's really kind of studied the shipping industry. And he's like, look, the shipping companies are making record amounts of money right now. And it's true, they are. Because of the supply chain crisis in the wake of the pandemic, So he's like, there are things that they could do to spend money to solve this problem. They could transform their fleet of shipping containers into what are called smart containers, which is essentially introducing some sort of technology, a little microchip into the container that would be able to track when a container is opened or shut, um, track its, um, its voyage from point A to point B, and just to have a better kind of handle on the voyage or the life cycle of the shipping container. The shipping companies will also say, hey, look, if this is such a big problem, which they all acknowledge that it is, why don't the governments of, say, Belgium and the Netherlands and other European uh, governments spend more money to hire more customs authorities? But people that I've talked to said that, look, you could hire an army of customs officials and you still would not be able to tackle this problem. Even if people disagree on what is the right solution, almost everybody agrees on one thing. If you're going to fix this problem, it's going to cost more money. And who's going to end up paying that? At the end of the day is the consumer. Your strawberries are going to be more expensive. Your shrimp is going to be more expensive. You're going to end up paying more for consumer goods. Lauren Etter, Vernon Silver, thanks so much for talking with me today. Thanks so much. Hey, thanks again. You can read more from Lauren Etter and Vernon Silver at Bloomberg.com. Thanks for listening to us here at The Big Take, the daily podcast from Bloomberg and iHeartRadio. For more shows from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen. Read today's story and subscribe to our daily newsletter at Bloomberg.com slash Big Take. And we'd love to hear from you. Email us with questions or comments to Big Take at Bloomberg.net. The supervising producer of The Big Take is... Vicki Vergolina. Our senior producer is... Catherine Fink. Our producers are... Mo Barrow. And... Michael Falero. Hilda Garcia. Is our engineer. Original music by Leo Sidrin. I'm Wes Kosova. We'll be back tomorrow with another Big Take.